character that you would have read about is the fact that it's polar and because it's polar it means it's a really good solvent. Uh, now the idea that water is polar it was explained in your textbook but I just want to recap this. If I look at a molecule of water which is one oxygen with two hydrogens, one on either side. It's kind of in the shape of a V. The side that has hydrogen is what we call partially positive. The symbol that I drew there is the lowercase letter delta in the Greek alphabet. Uppercase delta is the triangle that you might remember seeing in, say, physics formulas. To write this shape, it's like I wrote an S and then I kept going with the bottom. Uh, but the side with hydrogen is kind of positive, partially positive, and the side with oxygen is partially negative. Uh, we say partially because it's not an ionic compound, it doesn't have a full charge, but the electrons are closer to the oxygen, it pulls harder on them. And that's what being polar means. It means that the two sides of the molecule are not equal in the distribution of charge. Uh, a magnet uh, would be a nice uh, analogous example of something that has two different sides. Uh, you know, if you take two magnets and put them together, you try one way and they push each other apart, but you try the other way and they're attracted. Uh, so being polar means that your two sides are not the same. The reason that water is uh, or has a lot of these properties then is because of hydrogen bonds that are made. Since hydrogen from one water molecule is positive and oxygen from another water molecule is negative, they're attracted to each other. Positives and negatives attract. So that's the chemistry behind this, which will certainly not be the focus of any question that I asked you on a test, but that's why. What I would care about, for example, is the fact that water being polar means that it's good at dissolving things. Dissolving things like gases, like oxygen, CO2, nutrients, waste. Because it does all of those things, water is very effective at transporting substances either inside an organism because they are made of water or in the environment towards an organism. So the idea here would really be transport. So within, say, the human body, your blood is made of water. Water transports substances. In the environment, uh, there is water in lakes and ponds. There is groundwater. And that is how things like plants are getting the nutrients that they need. Now, the fact that water is polar doesn't just mean that it's a good solvent. There's a couple of other properties that go along with that. Uh, the second thing about water uh, is that it has a high heat capacity. Uh, so you might remember learning in Science 10, it heats up and cools down very slowly. In other words, it takes a lot of energy for water to change temperature. The result for an organism, put my best friend here, homeostasis, Organisms can maintain their body temperature even if the environment shows a much different temperature. You could have also said the word thermoregulation, which we learned in the chapter on circulation. The result for the environment would be the same principle but on a much larger scale. In the environment, being close to water usually means a more stable temperature. Now, I'm not saying more stable weather. Being close to water brings a whole host of other difficulties. But if we're talking just temperature, being close to water usually means that your temperature will not get as high or not get as low as another place at similar latitude to you that's not close to water. So for example, if we compare us, we'll use not green, we're right about here, and we compare somewhere that's in the UK, which is right there, we are in the middle of land. There is no real amount of water anywhere close to us. Uh, and you might remember learning in grade 10 that if you compare our weather to the weather of somewhere in the UK, we get much hotter in the summer, much colder in the winter, because we don't have water moderating our temperature.
Uh, it doesn't get as cold in the winter, uh, but it also doesn't get as hot in the summer generally there because water is moderating the temperature in the environment. The next two things really kind of go together, cohesion and adhesion. Uh, they are both due in part to water being polar. So these intermolecular forces like hydrogen bonding are because water is polar. So because water is polar, it's a good solvent. Because it's polar, it has cohesion. Because it's polar, it has adhesion. If any of you are in chem right now, you might recognize dipole, dipole, and London dispersion. I'm not going to quiz you on these types of forces, but I'm just telling you, because water's polar and it has these attractions between it and other molecules, it displays cohesion. The result uh, for an organism or for animals uh, in the fact that water is cohesive could be, for example, this, the idea of floating. So many of you noted on the sheet that you handed in yesterday that because water is cohesive, it allows things like insects to sort of exist on the surface of water. Uh, this is a water strider, so it literally walks on the surface of water because of the forces on the surface. Uh, but aside from that, uh, the idea of being able to stay near the surface of the water, uh, it has to do with density, but it also has to do with the force of the water molecules sticking together. Uh, the result for a plant, the idea would be water movement. Water moves up in a plant, which is against the force of gravity. And for water to accomplish this, uh, it needs to have a couple of forces working in its favor. The idea in a plant is that if one water molecule leaves the leaf, it will pull another water molecule up behind it. So because water is cohesive and it sticks together, as soon as one water molecule moves, it's like the head of a chain and it pulls all the other water molecules along with it. The other property, uh, which everyone wrote down yesterday as well, adhesion. So water molecules not only stick to each other, but to other surfaces and other types of molecules. So I mentioned in the daily review the idea of lubrication for your joints and your internal organs. Because water sticks to other surfaces, it's there coating everything, making sure that there's less friction. The result for a plant is the sort of same result as it was for cohesion. In this case, the reason that water moves upwards in a plant because of adhesion is because water is continuously sticking to the cells of the xylem, which is the tube that runs up the stem of the plant. Since water is attracted to those cells, it won't fall back down to the root of the plant. It'll sort of stay where it is, and the next time cohesion pulls it upwards, it'll keep moving upwards in the plant. Uh, and then the last property that you had to look at yesterday was density. Uh, and most people put one or the other of these two points. Uh, and both of them are important and both of them are valid. The first point is the one that we said on the daily review. It is important that ice floats because it's an insulator in the winter. It protects the rest of the water from freezing. It's also important uh, uh, that ice floats because when things melt in the spring, it allows for circulation. If water wasn't continuously moving uh, from lower to higher, so ice froze and then moved to the top, you wouldn't get as much of a cycle between the deep water, let's say, and the water that's near the surface. And this is important for organisms because we know that there are nutrients dissolved, there are wastes dissolved. Because of all of the substances that are dissolved in water, it's important that the water is circulating so that these substances can be exchanged or moved around in the environment. Now those are the things that everyone has, or most of you had, written down quite clearly actually uh, on your sheets from yesterday.
Uh, does anyone have any questions about the properties of water that they didn't get to ask already? So now that we've reviewed those things that you wrote down yesterday, there's just one more thing about water uh, that I'd like to show you. Uh, and it's something that we'll do for each of the cycles that we'll discuss. I'd like to show you what happens when we interfere with the water cycle. And then we'll talk about what happens when we interfere with the carbon cycle and other cycles for the rest of this week. So. I put the word unintended here because generally, as, as a rule, we are not on purpose trying to ruin our planet. It just seems to keep happening as a byproduct of other things that we are doing. So for the water cycle, one, not certainly not the only, but one of the unintended consequences of human interference would be acid rain. Now, there are a ton of other things that we do to water besides create acid rain, so this is just one example that I'm choosing. And there are a few things that I wanted to mention about acid rain. First of all, does anybody know when we call rain acid rain? So, for example, an acid, technically, is anything whose pH is less than 7. So, that means that technically, any rain that falls whose pH is less than 7 would be acid rain. Uh, by that definition, every drop of rain that falls basically on Earth is acid rain. So we don't call it acid until it gets somewhere in the neighborhood of 5.6. Now, depending on who you ask, the actual number that they'll give you for when we call acid rain, acid rain will vary. But that seems to be a pretty consistent number. The other number that I see a lot is this. When the pH is less than 4.5, that's when you actually start noticing some negative side effects from the rain having a low pH. So. Would I put this as a numeric response question? No, because there's not really a number that I could say, oh yeah, that's acid rain. Now, how does acid rain form? We're, do, we're going to be pretty general about the process. I've got a little picture here sort of illustrating what's happening. The first thing that happens is that by some process that we are performing, usually some sort of industrial process, gases are emitted into the atmosphere. Now, not all gas would cause acid rain. A couple of the major offenders for acid rain are what we call sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides. Now, I wrote SOX and NOX because there are many chemical compounds that have sulfur and oxygen in them and many that have nitrogen and oxygen in them. The X means that it could be maybe a 2 or maybe a 3. So we're trying to say there's more than one compound that would fit into that category. But in general, we're talking about substances that have oxygen and one of those other nonmetals in them. The second thing that happens is that the gas that's emitted reacts with water. So the gas comes up here into the air and it mixes with water vapor usually that's in the atmosphere. And the idea is that when those gases mix with water, that is when we can get an acid being formed. And then, of course, the third step would be the actual precipitation. So it would go one, two, three. And now that that precipitation is falling, instead of it being just water, now it is an acid. Now, there are things that can happen to living and non-living organisms. Uh, we'll start with 
living organisms. There are a couple of main things that would happen to a living organism if it was being affected by acid rain. The first one would certainly be tissue damage. So uh, you might have learned or remember learning that acids are corrosive. And if enough acid rain were to fall on a plant or on an animal, their external tissue would certainly be damaged by it. If they were consuming the water that was acidic, uh, then it would be their internal tissues that were damaged. So because water is sort of everywhere and organisms are living in it and using in it, tissue damage would certainly be a concern. We could have the issue of biomagnification of some of the compounds that make up the acid. Now, it's true that sulfur and oxygen and nitrogen uh, and hydrogen that are part of water are all part of living organisms, but not necessarily in that organization. And so sometimes you can get a buildup of compounds. For non-living organisms, I would say corrosion is the thing I would put at the top of my list because corrosion uh, could lead to so many other things. Acids will corrode uh, substances. They will corrode metals and rocks. Uh, so if you think about what buildings are built out of, uh, some of them, of course, are built out of wood, but lots of buildings are made of stone, and continuous acid rain will eat away at that stone. It could cause building damage. Uh, if we're thinking about being out in the environment, Continuous acid rain would cause damage to like the banks of a river, maybe cause flooding or avalanches because it's wearing down the rock walls that are holding structures up. How could we reduce damage? Obviously, less pollution. Prevention is uh, better than a cure, they always say. Uh, but another solution that we could come to would be something that's called liming. Liming is an example of a way that you can neutralize acid. Liming is when you add limestone, which is a base, to water that is acidic. Now, in our part of the country, we actually have naturally basic rock at the bottom of most of our bodies of water. Uh, so. In Alberta, let's say, a lot of the bodies of water uh, seem less affected by any acid rain because there is already limestone at the base uh, of the river or the lake or whatever neutralizing any acid that falls. Uh, but on the east coast, this is something that actually happens fairly frequently. They'll add this type of rock so that it'll help neutralize the acid that is there. So we're on to lesson five. Lesson five is, is about the carbon cycle. One of the things that I always like to add here is that it's really the carbon and oxygen cycle. It's very hard to discuss carbon without discussing oxygen uh, because one of the main ways that carbon exists is as CO2, which of course involves oxygen. So the first thing that we'll mention in terms of the carbon cycle uh, is maybe just a little bit about carbon itself and why discussing the carbon cycle would be important for living organisms. Carbon uh, is basically what you are made up of. Carbon is one of the essential elements in all living organisms. Uh, some of you may be aware that there is a branch of chemistry called organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is chemistry based on molecules that contain carbon, and it's like a whole separate type of chemistry. Uh, so the chemistry that you do in grade 10 and 11 is called inorganic chemistry, and you just kind of touch the surface of organic chemistry in grade 12. Uh, but there are tons and tons of molecules that have carbon as their base. Carbon can make four bonds, uh, and because of that, it can make a huge variety of different types of structures depending on what four things it's attached to. It could be attached to other carbon. It could be attached to other atoms. And there could be double or even triple bonds. 
So out of the four bonds it can make, three of them could be together in a triple bond. And so because of this incredible diversity, tons of things that living organisms need to survive are based in carbon. Specifically for us, I'm going to mention a few compounds that you already know about. Things like vitamins up here. Uh, and then there are three other pictures there. Uh, I hope that maybe you recognize one or two of them because they're the same pictures that I would have showed you in our biochemistry section on macromolecules. This picture over here is a lipid, specifically it is a triglyceride. Uh, and if you look, the base of the entire chain is carbon. So carbon is the molecule that the chain is made up of. This picture down here is glucose, which is a carbohydrate. Uh, we know that all ca carbohydrates could eventually be turned into glucose. So if glucose is made out of carbon, so are the rest of them. This picture over here illustrates proteins. So this would be the amino acid chain. And then this would be once the chain has wound up, uh, maybe gone together with another chain and formed a large protein. But all of those macromolecules, as well as vitamins, which I can't spell, are all made of carbon. So if there were no carbon, you would not be alive. Now the thing that I'd like to show you next comes from your textbook. Unless you have the notes printed out, you very probably want to look at your textbook so that you do not have to try to draw this sort of complex, convoluted diagram. So it's on page 43 of your textbook. Now, for some reason, uh, the picture that I have is in color, and your textbook decided to make it just be green. I don't know what their purpose was for that. I think it's prettier when it's in color. Uh, but the same thing is found on page 43 of your textbook. Now, would I ask you to reproduce this entire diagram from scratch? No, that would be ridiculous. But would I ask you things about the diagram? Of course. So I'm going to explain to you how this diagram is set up and what kinds of things I would ask you about. The first thing that you'll notice is that I put some words around my diagram that are not there in the textbook. In the text, it sort of describes how this is set up. But I think it would be worth it in your notes to even make a little chart that has four squares and put those labels around the outside. So something like this. Because it's important for you to be able to classify carbon based on where it is in its cycle. Now, as carbon cycles, uh, it goes to four different reservoirs. And that's what these four spots really are. There are four places where carbon is stored or carbon is kept in the biosphere. And we're classifying them two different ways. On the top, we're classifying them as available or unavailable. And then next to that, I wrote the word fast and slow. Your textbook likes to call the available side rapid cycling or fast cycling of carbon, and the unavailable side slow. I like the word available and unavailable because it sort of has an indication of how easy it would be for you to access it and acquire it. So you have two reservoirs that would be classified as available and two that would be classified as unavailable. The two on the left that are classified as available 
mean that the carbon that's in them would be easy for an organism to access. It wouldn't take a long time or it wouldn't be particularly difficult for them to get that carbon. Now, in the available category, there's two subcategories, biotic and abiotic. We could rename that living and non-living. So in the biotic available reservoir, we have living organisms and we have detritus because detritus is the waste that a living organism just produced. Those two things, as well as organisms that were recently living. So if an organism just died, it would still fall into the available biotic category. If it died a really, really long time ago, it wouldn't be there anymore. So I'm just adding the idea here. If it's living or it was recently living, this would be the category that would fall into. So why would that be available? Well, an animal could easily eat another animal. That's an available source of carbon. Since the animal is made of carbohydrates and lipids and proteins, if it eats the animal, it's obviously accessing its carbon. Underneath, we have the abiotic reservoir. It's still available, which means it's easy to access, but this would be anything that is not living. So you'll see here, atmosphere, soil, water. Those are th the three sections of the biosphere, the atmosphere, the lithosphere, and the hydrosphere. Each of them could contain some inorganic carbon. So for example, in the atmosphere, there would be CO2. CO2 is a gas. Plants can easily access CO2 so they can do photosynthesis. There would be carbon dissolved in the soil as well as water so that plants could access it or organisms living in the water could access it as well. Now on the unavailable side, the word slow is there. That means that these sources of carbon would be difficult to access it would take a long time uh, or it would be very hard for an organism to get the carbon out of them without some help. We still have biotic and abiotic categories here. So for example, biotic unavailable sources, I could put fossil fuels here and sort of sum it up. When an organism dies, and over a long, long period of time, the carbon that was in them is compressed by layers of rock, it can become fuel. So this would be of particular importance where we live, uh, because we have huge stores of fossil fuel underneath the land in our province. So coal, oil, peat, anything like that. Since they came from a living organism, they are still classified in the biotic category. And you'll see that the process in between those two boxes is fossilization. Now the unavailable abiotic category is basically rocks. Now we're not talking a tiny little pebble, we're talking like deep underground in layers and layers of rocks. There would be carbon in the form of a mineral. So not carbon that came from an organism dying, but carbon that was part maybe of an ionic compound. Uh, the reason this is called unavailable is because generally you would have to mine the rocks. Uh, and even if you did, there would have to be chemical reactions to isolate the carbon that was in them. Now between all of the reservoirs, there are arrows. And the arrows are the names of processes that happen in the carbon cycle. We will talk about a few of them specifically in the steps of the carbon cycle. Uh, but for example, I already mentioned this one. To get from biotic available to biotic unavailable, fossilization happens. To switch between the two available sources, this is where photosynthesis and cell respiration would come into play.
and those will be two of the key ones that we'll focus on in the carbon cycle. So during photosynthesis, abiotic carbon turns into biotic carbon, and during cell respiration, the opposite happens. Now since I named this fossil fuels, it might be fairly evident that if I burned one of them, I could make CO2 out of it. And then to get between the minerals that are in rocks, you need some sort of weathering process. Usually it's erosion. Uh, so to get the carbon that's out of a rock, out of a rock, like I said, you would have to mine it or have some sort of chemical reaction happen to get it out. And erosion would be a natural thing that happens over time as water washes over things. Uh, it will slowly erode away the rock and the carbon that's in it could then be dissolved in water. So, what would I ask you? What would be the question that I asked you? I would ask you first, perhaps, to classify a reservoir. So, for example, I could ask you <clears throat> on a quiz or on a test something like, If I had some water, so I had a solution that had carbon dissolved in it, which of the four reservoirs should I place that in? So since water has something dissolved in it, I'm looking for a spot where water would show up. And it's down here. So if I said, where does the carbon that's dissolved in water get classified? you would say available abiotic. So if I asked you to classify something's reservoir, I would look for two words, either available or unavailable, and then biotic or abiotic. So I could ask you, like, where would you personally go? You are a living organism. So you would get classified in available biotic. Now we could continue, uh, but that's the type of thing I would ask you if I wanted you to classify the reservoir. The other thing that I would ask you would be about the processes. So th those are the things that are on the arrows in between the different reservoirs. Uh, and specifically, uh, we're going to talk about a few of the processes that are on here uh, with a different illustration of the carbon cycle so that you can see how they are linked together with maybe a picture of an environment instead of just words. Now, does anyone want to ask anything immediately right here? So if it was me and I was going to study this, I would use just a little grid like this. Maybe make sure you know at least one or two examples of something that goes in each of those boxes because that's definitely how I would ask you a question about the storage reservoirs. So again, this picture is in your textbook on page 43. It's all green instead of beautiful different colors, but it's the same picture. So now we get uh, to the processes. Uh, so I have a little illustration here, uh, but it's really the words that are along the right-hand side that we are going to focus on. We need to know about photosynthesis, cellular respiration, fossilization, combustion, volcanic eruptions, diffusion, and carbon sinks. So what I'm going to ask you to do is this. For each of those processes, see if you can decide, based on the diagram that's in your textbook or what we just said, uh, which storage reservoirs it is exchanging between. Now I'm just going to make a couple of comments here, uh, especially about the last thing, diffusion and carbon sinks. <clears throat> 
When I say diffusion, and that's why I put a picture over here of the ocean, uh, we're generally talking about carbon diffusing into water. Uh, and a carbon sink is something that stores a lot of carbon. So please make sure you have those six terms written down. And I'd like for you to try to identify, <coughs> some of them will be very obvious because they're on the picture, but which storage reservoirs those things are connecting or, or are linking. Uh, and then there are a couple of questions in your textbook that I would like uh, to ask you to look at. They are page 46, number 9, and number 10. <coughs> 